KE5STF, are you on frequency? <coughs> this is KE5STF, I'm on frequency. We will ask you to please continue with this evening's training. Good evening, this is David Gilmore, Kilo Echo 5, Sierra Tango Foxtrot, and please uh, open up the first slide in the presentation. I am the Shelley 10th Ward Emergency Communications Specialist, and this evening we'll be discussing the Ward and Community Emergency Communication Plan that I have developed and made available uh, for the Shelley 10th Ward. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is world-renowned for its ability and willingness to provide service during and after an emergency, and so any ward emergency communication plan would by default need to include the community. In our ward boundaries, we have 150 households, some of which are members of the Church of Jesus Christ and some are not, and uh, all 150 households are included in the ward emergency communications plan. Please go to slide two. As an introduction, my wife and I have moved 18 times in 42 years. We have lived through earthquakes, tornadoes, wildfires, floods, and winter storms. These disasters caused long-term power outages resulting in no electricity, no water, no natural gas, no sewer, no emergency services, no fire department, no ambulances, no groceries, no gasoline, no employment, no school, limited mobility due to downed trees on roads or roads completely destroyed or flooded, no access to money in banks or credit unions, no internet, no email, no cell phone service, no texting, no air conditioning, and no gas or electric heat for our homes lasting up to 14 days. We have lived in California, Utah, Washington State, and Texas. It seems no matter where we move, man-made and natural disasters follow us. We now live here in Idaho, so get prepared. Slide 3. Tonight we will be discussing the mission, method, and implementation of a ward emergency communications plan and any questions and answers at the end. Slide 4. The mission is pretty direct. It comes from church headquarters from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. And in their emergency communications planning guide, they say, Leaders should be prepared to report the nature of the disaster, welfare of members and missionaries, the condition of meeting houses, and any requests for assistance as quickly and completely as possible. This requires plans for communication methods that are not dependent on either the phone system or power grid or vehicle transportation, and we need to keep in mind that quarantines may make it impossible to, to make personal visits. They suggest that communication possibilities are personal vi visits via foot, bike, etc. if it's safe, MURS radios, FRS radios, GMRS radios, amateur uh, radio, or satellite phone. Slide 5. In part of the mission of the ward, we need to identify potential emergencies. In our ward, which yours may be different, we've identified these potential emergencies. Flooding, earthquake, wildfire, severe weather, high winds, heavy snows, extreme temperatures, and power outages. We've also identified man-made emergencies, which could include disease, pandemics, nuclear fallout, electrical magnetic pulse, EMP, terrorist or gang activity, toxic spills, war, any other situation the bishop determines as an emergency, for example, assisting or performing search and rescue for a lost child or elderly. Slide 6. Our ward is nestled next to the Snake River, and this map came from the Idaho Falls Water District, showing that basically 90% of our homes in the Shelley 10th Ward would be underwater if the Idaho Falls Dam broke. It's important that you identify potential emergencies for your area. Slide 7. In identifying potential communications disruptions, it's possible that we have extended loss of power, which would make uh, no internet or social media posts available and no email. If equipped with battery backup landline telephone networks may provide 8 to 12 hours of service, cellular services may be available for 4 to 8 hours. In the case of a power grid cyber attack, all power could be instantly lost. Slide 8. Potential communication disruptions include phone network congestion. Emergencies can quickly overload landline and cell phone services. We've experienced this numerous times in emergencies. Do not count on your text being re uh, received or that you can continue to text successfully. Even though you may have sent a text, you, may, you cannot count that it will actually ever be delivered. Slide 9. Additional communications disruptions could be cell phone network blockage. 
FEMA may block public use to cell phones and texting services to facilitate first responders to use services uninterrupted. We experienced this uh, in Houston after Hurricane Ike. FEMA came in and immediately turned off all access to cell phone services to the general public so that the first re responders could uh, work uninterrupted. In their report on their uh, website, they mentioned that the only mistake that they made was that they did not turn off texting. So be prepared for a complete cell phone blockage if that, that occurred. Slide 10. With that mission in mind, we have uh, decided that we need to have trained personnel, established and working ward emergency communications network, be able to use that network to relay information to the bishop and to the stake, relay information from the community, bishop, and stake back to the households, and this is asterisk because in my 20 years of working with emergency communications, the number one problem that breaks the entire communications is this right here. It's not such a problem getting information up to upline, but getting it back to 150 households is uh, more difficult than anticipated in most situations. So that has been the backbone to building this communications network for the Shelley 10th Ward. And then finally, continue to facilitate ongoing communications with the personnel and emergency communications network. Slide 11. Our method to do that is to encourage all households in the Shelley 10th Ward boundaries to have a radio, to use inexpensive non-FCC licensed handheld radios to make it easy for these households to get the radios and use them, to hold a monthly neighborhood radio network call, and to divide the ward into three zones with three zone leaders and ass assistants and in each of those zones have five districts for a total of 15 district leaders and 15 assistants. Slide 12. As you can see this is our map for the ward emergency communications. I've divided the ward into three sections, three zones, and you, you can see the 15 districts here. All communications will be done on, uh, in a district and zone level and you'll see that on the next slide. Slide 13. So that everybody understands the communications flow, I developed the ward emergency communications flow chart. At the top you can see how families are communicating with families and helping each other in their area. And then uh, district leaders and assistants will contact those families, find out their needs and resources, and then send that upline to the zone leaders. Those three zone leaders will deliver that information to me as the Ward Emergency Communications Network, I mean uh, specialist. I will then take that information to the Ward Emergency Response Committee, which is primarily created out of the Ward Council, which would include all the presidents of the different organizations, including the bishopric member over welfare. All this communication is done on a ward level with FRS radios, and then when we go to the stake level, then we would be using ham radios. You can see there's two different lines of communications. One is through the ward emergency communications specialist, then to the stake emergency communications specialist, then to the Idaho Falls South region net, and so forth. And the bishop has an ecclesiastical communications line that he will be following. Next slide. So in considering how to communicate, we need to decide which radios to use. We have amateur radio, MURS radios, GMRS radios, and FRS radios. So we need to look at the pros and cons of those different opportunities. Slide 15. The uh, pros for the amateur radio are a lot, and they include up to 50 mile range. For example, I have a little 4 watt handheld radio with an external antenna that I can easily get 50 miles radius around my, uh, my location. With just a standard handheld radio with the uh, antenna that comes with it, uh, one to five miles is a pretty general range that you'll be able to have. A big advantage is you can use repeaters and so that uh, you can dramatically ex uh, expand that range. I am easily able to communicate with people in Arizona using the repeaters and the networks here in Idaho. You also have the advantage of being able to take off the rubber ducky antenna centered antenna and replaced with a mobile or base antenna to, for mobility. And uh, there is a big advantage to having a large radio community to help new radio operators learn the ropes in uh, using amateur radio. Another advantage is radios have become more and more affordable, uh, as little as $25 for an entry level radio. With all the frequencies available, it should not be a problem finding a frequency in an emergency. The disadvantages and the pushback that I found from the general public is they don't want to take a test, 
They don't want to pay a licensing fee. They absolutely are scared to death of programming a radio, and there is a steep learning curve to using amateur radio. Slide 16. GMRS radios have a lot of the same benefits as amateur radio, a very uh, large range, up to 50 miles with ex external antennas, a uh, one to five miles for the regular standard antenna on a handheld radio, the ability to use repeaters, mobile base station antennas, a, another large community to help learn the ins and outs of using GMRS radios, low cost of entry, $39 is a pretty good price for an entry a quality in a GMRS radio. Another big advantage is that these radios have channels and those are pre-programmed frequencies in channels. And there is no FCC test. The disadvantage is, is that in order to transmit above 2 watts you do need to get an FCC license. That license is $35 and includes your spouse, children, parents, aunts, uncles, nieces and nephews for 10 years. There is a lot of use on GMRS below 2 watts, and so finding a frequency or channel in an emergency may be a problem. And there are only a few limited high power channels available in those 22 channels. Privacy channels are really absolutely useless. Move to slide 17. Uh, MURS radios, I found these to be very, very useful, primarily because hardly anybody uses them. It's almost like having a private network with no fees at all. So uh, I actually found no businesses that use MURS in, in my scanning of those frequencies for two weeks. So you may want to check your area for the availability of M uh, MURS. Very little usage, no FCC fees, tests, or licenses. The radio that we used for testing was only $20 and it worked really well. Pre-programmed channels, basically take it out of the box and you can start using it if you're not using any privacy channels. A very short learning curve. And you can also add external antennas to it. The disadvantage is, is, is that it's a very, very short range, basically a mile. Uh, outdoor and indoor antennas are available, but I don't see the general public spending the time and money and effort setting up uh, these antennas. Uh, you cannot use repeaters, so the distance does remain pretty small, and we only have five channels available. This is not a common radio for families, and so anybody who wanted to join this network if we decided to use MURS radios in the ward would have to buy a new radio. Slide 18. For FRS radios, the, a lot of advantages, no FCC licenses, fees or tests are required. You can get a set of two radios for $69.95 on Amazon that includes headsets, chargers, rechargeable batteries and so forth. They come completely pre-programmed if you're not using privacy channels. Very short learning curve. A lot of people already have these radios, so incorporating this as the radio for the Ward Emergency Communications Network makes it pretty easy for people to step into it because they use these radios for family outings and activities and camping and hunting and so forth. The disadvantages is, again, it's a short range, somewhere between one and three miles, depending on your urban or rural environment. Uh, you cannot remove the antenna. It's a fixed antenna cannot use repeaters, so that continues li limiting the distance. There are only 22 channels available. Availability of channels in emergency could be an issue, and that's why we have backup channels established in our ward emergency plan. Privacy channels, as previously discussed, are really useless, and there is a lot of heavy use on these radios. Slide 19. So we identified our mission, then we identified how we wanted to fulfill that mission, and then we have to implement it. Working with Barry, my ward preparedness specialist, he and I spent many hours testing every possible radio that I could purchase and find on FRS and MURS. And then once we had finalized our testing, I decided to take this to the bishop and to the ward council. Slide 20. This is KE5STF. When I met with the ward council, I presented the emergency communications plan, showed them the ward emergency communications map, and helped them understand how I divided up the ward into districts and zones, and then how we would take that information to the emergency ward response committee. We discussed that we wanted to test the two different radios, FRS and MURS, so they agreed to, later that day, participate in a test. I lent them all FRS and MURS radios for those who did not have them and handed them a test network instruction sheet. Slide 21. 
This is just a, a snapshot of the script that I gave them. You will have full access to the entire document, so we won't be spending time on these uh, snapshots of the script. But anyway, so these will be provided in the download that you'll have access to. Slide 22. Again, this is the script that I came up with. You may want to vary it depending on how you want to run your net, but this seemed to work well for me. Slide 23. This is the instructions on the sheet that all the ward council members had. And most of them had not used radios like this, and so I gave them kind of step-by-step -step procedures, where to stand, how to hold a radio, how to talk, and so forth. Slide 24. And then, because we were testing two different radios, FRS and MURS, we wanted to test the transmission quality and the audio quality and the static clarity. I set up a scale for them to report that on slide 25. Uh, included on that same piece of paper was this report and as we went through and called everybody on the ward council over the radios, uh, everybody else on the call graded the clarity for audio and static for FRS and MURS. At the end of this event, I drove to everybody's house, picked up the radios that were lent out and picked up their data sheets and it was unanimous that FRS was a better radio for our situation because the MURS radio just did not have the power to make it through the distance of our 2.3 mile long ward and so we went with FRS. Slide 26. So hands down the FRS radio was significantly better because of distance. We tested many different brands and models of radios and the one that I recommend uh, as being the absolute best at any price for a handheld radio of 2 watts or less is the Midland GXT 1000 Victor Papa 4. Uh, that's available on Amazon, uh, eBay and other uh, online sources. Probably also in other sports local stores. Slide 27. Uh, two weeks after that uh, practice net I met with the ward council again. They all agreed that we needed to have another test with their own radio so they would learn how to charge them and change channels and so forth. So they all agreed to either purchase a radio, uh, FRS radio, or use one that they already had. They also agreed to contact four neighbors. The ward council members would act as district leaders. So they contacted four neighbors each, which would include five total homes, including their own home. And then they were to uh, report whether these n homes had a red, yellow, or green flag in the window and any neighbors that did not have those flags were given those flags actually you know cut pieces of cloth to hang in their in the windows and before the the uh, practice net started the ward council members acting as district leaders walked to the four neighbors around their house and uh, recorded which color flag they had in their windows next slide uh, this document here was uh, given to all the participating households. It kind of explained to them what the exercise was about and what it was for and that they were invited to p participate as a household in the ward boundaries. Slide 29. This is the uh, script that I wrote for the zone leaders to call and you can, you, you can review this at your own leisure when you download the document. Slide 30. This is KE5STF. This is the final sheet of the document, and this is the, the document that I used when I was calling as the ward emergency communication specialist to the zone leaders, and the zone leaders were giving me their report. Slide 31. So what was the result of this ward council practice net? Well, it was interesting because we did this on a, a holiday weekend, and the bishop asked if it would be better to do it on a different weekend, and I said, no, this is actually perfect because you can't control the environment, what's going on in the world when an emergency happens. You, you just can't schedule emergencies. And so uh, we went forward, and yes, half of the ward council was either out of town or actually forgot about the exercise. So 50% of the ward council acting as district leaders reported in. Unfortunately, those who knew that they were going to be out of town and planned on being out of town had not made previous arrangements for alternatives. And this is a good example of why we need to have district leaders and assistants, zone leaders and assistants, ward emergency communication specialists and assistants, because in a real life emergency, you may only get half of the people to show up, but at least you have half of them and they would be trained. 100% of the zone leaders did report in. All transmissions were at a half a watt and were very clear through the entire 
a testing from furthest north, furthest south, east and west in the ward boundaries. The district leader's nets average about three minutes. The zone leader's nets average three minutes. And within 18 minutes, uh, I reported to the bishop on the health and well-being of all the households that were being reported in the ward. Slide 32. I have been in emergency situations after uh, hurricanes and floods and earthquakes where bishops had waited up to two hours to get reports and only had 20% of the ward information. Having experienced that, this is why I think it's critical that all households have radios and that a detailed procedure and method is outlined so that everybody is informed. Slide 33. Last Sunday, uh, on the 29th, I had a 10-minute presentation in Sunday school with the ward members in Sunday school class where I explained the emergency communications planned, handed out a handout with the emergency communications map and also the channels so they could identify where they lived on the map and which channel they would be on in a ward emergency communications network. Uh, I requested all members who don't already have FRS radios who want to voluntarily participate in the radio net to purchase radios. There is a lot of interest and a lot of support from the ward members to do such. Uh, all 150 households will receive the handout this week, so I'm going door to door and making sure that every household, whether a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or not, receives that information so they can join the net. And so we will have a ward and communication initial net on June 7th, 2022. Slide 34. So this is uh, the final edition, although this is a living document of the Shelley 10th Emergency Communications Plan, which you'll be able to download. You'll see, as instructed by Salt Lake City, that a ward emergency communication plan should be a simple document that you should be able to write on one page. If you look in section two, the ward emergency communication plan is one page. However, to make that happen, we have several supporting pages. And as you can see, I have a lot of the documents that I shared with you this evening and significantly more in detail in this plan. So the, the section two is the mission and then the detailed method in making that mission happen. And 2.14 outlines specific responsibilities for everybody involved in the emergency communications net from the bishop to the heads of the households. Slide 36. Section 3 is uh, links and FAQs, directions and recommendations from the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints on uh, what is expected and needed uh, for a ward emergency communications net and I've also included some forms there. Section 4 are radio options, the pros and cons which we discussed briefly here this evening. And section five are the real life implementation and testing and reporting. Slide 37. So again, I've included all of the scripts and the uh, preambles and reports and so forth that you may want to use, uh, edit for your own use. And then in section six, I go into uh, recommendations for FRS, GMRS, RS radios and uh, the other radios and, and equipment. I highly recommend that you have rechargeable batteries and a good battery charger, I recommend the best batteries and chargers in my opinion. Slide 38. I made a simple uh, link so you can download the document so you don't have to remember a big long Google Docs link. So just go to ldsprepper.com slash emergency comms and you'll be able to download that document and go through it at your leisure and customize that to your ward or community, whatever uh, it may be. Slide 39. I think that you'll find that if you identify your mission and your method and then work on the implementation, then you will have a successful and well-prepared emergency communications network for your community and your, uh, your ward. The last thing the bishop told me on Sunday before I made the presentation to the ward was, without practice, this doesn't do anything for us. The implementation is very important. Slide 40. Thank you very much for your attention. This is David Gilmore, KE5STF, Ward emergency communication specialist for the Shelley 10th Ward. I'll take any questions at this time. KM4 QAA. Go ahead, QAA. Yes, this is KM4 QAA. David, I know you recommended one particular Midland FRS radio, and I wonder if it comes out of the box with none of these pesky codes in it, because I've just recently run into an issue where I bought FRS radios, and they've got these codes, and I've got to figure out how to get them out of there. So, um, 
how do you how do you approach that, especially if people buy some other radio? A great question. They do come with all 22 channels already pre-programmed, and then if you want to add privacy channels, you go into the submenus and add privacy channels. But you have to go through an extra step to do that. So it's out of the box, ready to use at the uh, the primary 22 channels. Thank you for your question. Are there any other questions this evening? KC7 IHV. IHV. I just uh, wanted to say a couple of things here. And uh, David, you've done an awesome job here tonight. But I wanted to remind uh, those that have not gone as far as you have and haven't started yet that uh, before you uh, jump in and, and say what David has is, is the way to go, you need to take and do just exactly what David did, and that's test radios in your area. I know of a number of groups, wards, and stakes that have gone out and bought equipment only to find out that uh, it didn't quite cover their area and didn't do the job they were looking for. The second item would be uh, batteries. Uh, these things, if you're going to use rechargeables, you got to have a way to charge them. And if you're going to use regular batteries, they eat those up rather quickly. At least in, that's been my experience. The other thing that I wanted to mention was uh, those individuals that go out, or those stakes and wars that go out and get the information and get it sent in, and it gets sent to both civil authorities and to the church leadership, uh, and that includes the bishop, the uh, stake president, Area 70, and on to Salt Lake. Those, in, those organizations that get their information in there first will most likely get the resources first. So I'm not trying to start a resource war of who gets what done first, but if you uh, get yours done within a matter of uh, hours or a day or so, and others take a week or two, uh, and then wonder why the resources are not available, uh, you're just going to have to deal with it. So uh, timeliness is, is important for everybody. And again, David, I appreciate what you've done here. You've done an awesome job. This is KC7 IHV. Thank you, IHV. Excellent recommendations. A any other questions? KI7 IQK. IQK. So I've been trying to look up that radio that she recommended, that Midland. It looks like on the websites I have, they're now calling this a GMRS radio. And so I just need some clarification. If you purchase a GMRS, is it still legal to use it? on the FRS channels at low power without a GMRS license, KI7IQK. Thank you for your question, yes. Uh, they are using marketing and marketing it as a GMRS radio, but it is limited to two watts. And that, and when you download the document at ldsprepper.com slash emergency comms, you'll see all the FCC information in that document regarding FRS and GMRS. And any radio that does not transmit above 2 watts is considered FRS, even if it's marketed as GMRS. I think their marketing angle, uh, because there is a large GMRS uh, uh, audience and interest out there, but it is limited to 2 watts. KB7 ITU. ITU. Uh, yeah, just a, just a comment. If, if, you're, if you have any questions whether it's legal to use in the FRS uh, spectrum, the, the radio, uh, like David said, it, that it has to be two watts, but if you cannot detach the antenna, that's a dead giveaway for FRS. Uh, GM or S, you, it, it's, it's legal to detach the antenna, but FRS it is not. So, And that was mentioned in David's uh, uh, information here. So, But that's one of the uh, foolproof ways to ensure that you're using the proper radio on the FRS bands. KB7 ITU. Thank you for your clarification, Steve. And that particular radio has a non-removable antenna. Uh, any other questions or follow-up? Hearing none, thank you very much for your attention this evening. This is KE5STF, turning it back over to Net Control. KE5STF, thank you so much for the training tonight. This is KS7BRO, Net Control Station for this ERC net. For the information of those on the net, the regional reports are as follows. Um, Salmon had no report tonight. Idaho Falls North Region reported 25 check-ins with 18 on emergency power. Idaho Falls South Region reported 23 check-ins with 18 on emergency power. Rexburg reported 41 check-ins with 35 on emergency power. Rigby reported 28 check-ins with 27 on emergency power. That gives us a total of 117 check-ins tonight. 
with 98 on emergency power. Thank you everyone for your participation in this evening's net. The emergency response communications net is now closed and all stations are released. This is KF7BRO in Northeast Idaho Falls. The frequency is now clear for normal communication.